Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, the ADA and the Internet, Stormy Weather Ahead. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law. Sans the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is hired for the particular case. In today's webinar, Richard will discuss understanding website accessibility, why accessibility matters to your client, history of website accessibility law and litigation, what we know and don't know about the law today, dealing with uncertainty and an ounce of prevention, what to do if your client is sued, slideshows and real concerns, a call to action. To give you a little background about our presenter, Richard is a board certified civil trial lawyer with 37 years of experience representing businesses and individuals in litigation, arbitration, and mediation. He has served as an adjunct professor teaching disability law at the Dedman School of Law at Southern Methodist University and has served on the examination committee for civil trial certification for the Texas Board of Legal Spe Specialization and as an adjunct professor of trial advocacy at Texas Wesleyan School of Law. Richard is the author of Accessibility Defense, a blog for businesses that focuses on avoiding and defending lawsuits brought under the Americans with Disabilities Act and Fair Housing Act. Richard frequently speaks on ADA and FHA issues and presents webinars of these and other topics. He has been interviewed by The Economist and Forbes, among other publications, on issues related to ADA and FHA litigation. Attendees who require a passcode, the word for today is ADA. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay on for the full 60 minutes as you are required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the widget at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Richard, the presentation is now turned over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, ADA and the Internet, stormy weather ahead. The first time I did a version of this webinar was in 2015, and it was um, had the same title, stormy weather ahead. That hasn't changed in the last five years uh, because this is a subject where there is a lot of activity, but there has been, in some sense, very little development. However, let's get a couple of things out of the way first. Um, as you just heard, um, I am not your lawyer, and by giving you the information in this webinar, I'm not forming an attorney-client relationship. So uh, please don't regard anything I say today as advice about a particular legal problem you may be facing. Um, if there are questions, please don't mention any specific cases. We're going to keep it general. Um, I've been introduced once, but uh, just so you know, know who I look, what I look like in a suit and tie, uh, this is it. Um, as Najah said, I've been doing uh, this kind of work for a little more than a decade uh, with this specialty in accessibility law. And I've been doing uh, work related to accessibility in the Internet since litigation first broke in this area around 2015. Uh, before that time, it wasn't actually a subject of any importance frank, um, in ADA law. So let's start with our first topic, um, understanding website accessibility. Uh, because this is the subject that I think most uh, lawyers and many non-lawyers have trouble with because it's hard to put yourself in the um, position of someone with a disability who's trying to navigate the Internet. Um, to 
understand accessibility, we have to start with something called assistive technology. And we have a few examples here. Uh, one is a refreshable Braille display. Um, this is a display that instead of reading text out loud that's on the screen, it produces uh, Braille characters that a blind person uh, can uh, read, obviously, with their fingertips. Uh, there are also screen magnifiers. This can be uh, generally software or hardware. It simply makes everything bigger for people who have vision disabilities. There is speech input software. Uh, people with disabilities that make it impossible or difficult to use a keyboard and a mouse um, can use speech input to control their computer. Um, there's even alternate input uh, for people who have disabilities that prevent them speaking. They can use head pointers, eye tracking, and so forth. And then there's the most common kind of assistive technology, which is called screen reading software. Uh, screen readers, um, one of them uh, for Windows is called JAWS, J-A-W-S. There's one built into the um, Macintosh operating system called VoiceOver. Uh, these programs in their origin literally read what was on the screen. So back when websites were mostly text on a screen, these read the screen, hence the name screen readers. Um, in their incarnations today, they're much more sophisticated. They actually do more than read the screen. They read the commands. They um, give an indication of the structure of web pages for those who know how to use them. But they're the most important assistive technology in terms of website accessibility because the um, most difficulties and the largest number of people who have difficulties are blind or have very low vision and use screen readers. So that's going to lead us to a practical definition of website accessibility. An accessible website is one that works with assistive technologies to give disabled users access to the content of the website. Now, note, there are two parts of this. Note, it must work with assistive technologies. A website that is designed in such a way that it cannot be used by a screen reader or by a braille reader or um, using uh, speech input software um, is going to be not accessible because it doesn't work with the te technology. But even if the website works with the technology, if it's designed in such a way that the technology can't get to the content, it's just as inaccessible as it would be if it didn't work with the technology at all. And to understand that, I'm going to just give you one example. Uh, this is a website uh, for an apartment complex. Um, and you're seeing a little bit of the screen. And as you can see, it's, what I've highlighted is um, the home button on the first menu on this website. And we're going to talk about the visual experience versus the screen reader experience. Your visual experience is that you would uh, point your mouse at home. It would take you to the home page of the website. You see off to the right a number of other menu items that you can click on, each of which will, of course, take you to some other part of the website. If you're using a screen reader, you can't hear or you can't see any of this. All that's going to happen is that as the screen reader works its way through the page or the structure of the page, it will get to the home button that we see there, and it will say this. This is the Macintosh uh, voiceover. Visited link, home page, home menu navigation. You are currently on a button. To click this button, press control, option, space. So that's everything a blind person knows about this web page. They're on a button called home page home. It's part of a menu. And you can click the button by pressing control, option, space. Um, screen reader users are very adept keyboard users by necessity, so that's not a problem. What is a problem is that they don't know what else is on the menu. They know there's a menu, but they don't know what else is there. They don't know if it's an up, or down, up and down menu or a left and right menu. And they don't know exactly how you're supposed to get to the next menu item. There's only one instruction, and that's to press Control-Option-Space to click this particular menu item. Um, 
Now, those of you who've navigated around web pages before know that there are a number of different things you might use. Uh, for example, you could use the arrow keys. Um, in this particular case, it's a horizontal menu. If you use the up and down arrow keys, nothing happens at all. If you use the left and right arrow keys, um, it will go to the right, but not to the left. Um, and if you use the tab key, which is the most common way for moving from one item to another in a web page, it will actually take you down to a menu that's in the middle of the page below that has to do with selecting the number of bedrooms in the apartment you might be interested in seeing. So the tab key takes you to a completely random place on the web page. And um, getting back to where you were takes a good deal of effort. Um, if you think this is um, not a problem, I will tell you that an experienced screen reader, user, screen reader user who is blind that tested this page took about 10 minutes to figure out that the best way to get to the next menu item was the left and right arrow keys. Um, part of that was because the tab key, which was his first choice, took him so far away from the home menu that it took a good deal of time to figure out how to get back. Um, and I will tell you, there are instructions that to tell you to use the left and right arrow key. The problem is they are in a pop-up box that only appears if you hover your mouse over the home button. Of course, a blind user cannot hover their mouse pointer over anything, and they wouldn't hear the pop-up box anyway. Uh, this is one example out of dozens of examples from this website of things that you simply um, would find extremely difficult, if not impossible, to do using a screen reader. And these are all things that can be easily fixed by simply including more instructional material in the website itself, in the hidden text that um, visual users don't see but that screen readers can read or by reorganizing the web pages in a more, organal, uh, in a more organized fashion. Um, our problem, and the problem with many developers, is because they are visually oriented. They don't pay attention to the underlying structure, which is what blind people are, use, are dealing with. Um, so, um, and by the way, if you think, well, this is just um, you know, a particularly bad example. This particular website is built on a template used by different developers, and there are thousands of websites built on the same template, and every single one of them has all the same problems. So this is what we're talking about with the problem of accessible websites. These are websites that, as a practical matter, a disabled person simply cannot use. Um, so. Why does accessibility matter? Um, after all, there aren't a million um, or there aren't a zillion blind people or disabled users. Um, but it's a mistake to think that this isn't a serious problem. Um, I have some scary statistics for you. Uh, according to WebAIM, uh, which is a major um, web uh, consulting and accessibility company, 97% of the top 1 million websites fail a basic test of accessibility. So 97% of the websites that are in use in the world have at least some accessibility problems. They may be serious, they may be fatal, they may be not too bad, but 97% have some accessibility problems. And those accessibility problems lead to litigation. This is some data uh, based on um, that I got from UsableNet, another consultant in the accessibility area. There was a very steep rise in website accessibility lawsuits through mid-2018. Um, it has slacked off then, but that's only because we're looking here at federal filings. Uh, what happened in 2018 was that uh, the federal courts in California started making it a little bit difficult, a little bit more difficult to pursue accessibility claims. And so the action moved from federal court in California to state court in California. If you included state court filings in California um, and to a lesser degree, degree in Florida, 
this line would be much steeper at the end. So the number of website cases is continuing to go up. It's continuing to go up fairly rapidly. It's only that the venue has changed. Another statistic, and this is of particular importance to businesses, is simply that we have an aging population and that one of the things that goes with age is disability. So um, as you can see, this is a statistic from the CDC concerning blindness. Um, as the population ages, you are going to have more and more individuals trying to use the internet that have difficulty because of vision. And we've finally reached the point where those older users are actually internet users. 20 years ago, you could say that grandpa didn't know how to use the internet. That is no longer true. Um, these people, particularly the elderly who may not be able to travel or get around, particularly during COVID-19, are heavy website users and they need accessible websites to use it. Which brings us to the business case. Uh, according to a recent survey, 69% of disabled users click away from a website if they find it difficult to use. 75% spend their money where it's easiest. And 90% don't bother to tell you that they had a problem before they leave. So I frequently have clients who say, well, we don't have any disabled users, so it's not a problem. Well, the answer is the reason you don't have any disabled users is because they tried, they left, and they spent their money elsewhere. So it's not merely a question of obeying the law, as we'll see. It is a question of losing business. So we've got a problem. It's a serious problem. It's got a business aspect and a legal aspect. And finally, there's no easy way out of it, um, as Tom Petty would say. Uh, remediation is necessary. Uh, to obey the law and to keep your customers, but it does not eliminate the risk of litigation, as we will see. The settlement cost of lawsuits um, based on website accessibility is not related to the merits of the lawsuit. It's based strictly on the cost of defense. It is not related to the injury suffered by the plaintiff. In most website lawsuits, the plaintiff has not suffered any injury. Um, and no matter what standard you think your website or your client's website needs to meet, there's a harder standard that someone will sue over. So there's no easy way out of this. What we're going to do today is try to understand the legal situation so that you can um, either use or give practical advice about website accessibility from a legal standpoint. So what do we know and what do we not know? Um, well. I should have focused in on about the law of accessibility. Um, let's start with some easy cases. Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which covers um, federal websites, federal government websites, um, has a very, uh, not an easy standard to meet, but a very clear standard it's called WCAG 2.0. We'll talk a little more about that. But Section 508 is an easy one. If you represent a federal agency, they already know about it. They've been working on it for uh, probably a dozen years. Um, the Air Carrier Access Act, which um, will cover um, airline websites and uh, related uh, tools, also has a uh, clear standard for website accessibility. Um, it's also easy because the Air Carrier Access Act does not have any private remedy. So there's not a risk of a thousand or a million private lawsuits against airlines. Um, ADA Title I, this is the title of the Americans with Disabilities Act that covers employment. Um, relatively easy because under Title I, the employer's obligation is simply to create a website for internal employee use that is accessible to the one or two or three disabled uh, users who might need to use it. So there's no blanket requirement that internal websites be accessible. It's simply a one at a time. What do we have to do to let one particular employee use the website? Title II, state and local government. Well, um, 
There is no explicit requirement in Title II that websites be accessible. However, websites of a municipality or a local government agency are treated as a program of that government. Programs are required to be accessible. The standard under the ADA for Title II is meaningful access to the programs, um, but nobody knows what that means. Um, it is a defense to a fundamental alteration or undue burden. As we'll see, those aren't necessarily useful. And once again, you have to watch out for 29 U.S.C. Section 794, more commonly known as Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, because any state or federal agency or government, um, in, I'm sorry, state or local, including municipalities, that gets federal funds also has to meet the requirements of the Rehabilitation Act. So there's a double requirement. And you'll see, um, for example, um, ADA lawsuits against institutional uh, institutions, like um, the probably the most famous are a pair of cases against Harvard and MIT uh, by the National Association of the Deaf. Um, they're alleged to have violated both um, the Rehabilitation Act and the ADA, and in some cases, Title II. Title III is where the most lawsuits are filed. Certainly 95% or more of the litigation is in Title III entities, which are, of course, um, for practical purposes, businesses. Um, and those are the areas where we also have the most legal uncertainty. Um, some of the questions that we're gonna talk about uh, does Title III even cover websites? And what about California? Since there's so much action in California, it deserves some discussion of its own. What is the injury that Title III protects against? In order to have standing to sue, a person with a disability has to have suffered an injury of the kind that the statute protects against. And it's not clear what injury Title III protects against in the case of websites. Um, what does it mean to have an accessible website and how do you prove it under Title III? This too is an open question. What is the role of your standard defenses under the ADA? These are defenses of fundamental alteration, unreasonableness, and undue burden. Well, how these defenses might apply depends in part on why the ADA itself applies to the website. And as we'll see, we don't have a consistent theory of why the ADA applies to websites. And then finally, who's liable for an inaccessible website? Um, the owner certainly is, the developer might be, and what about third parties who have plugins or other contributions to the website? Taking those up one at a time, let's start with our subject, our, our website subject to Title III. Um, the first theory, um, has always been, no, they're not covered at all. The ADA says nothing about websites, therefore, they're just not in it. Um, a second theory says, yes, websites are covered, but because Title III of the ADA covers physical places of public accommodation, at least on its face, a website is only covered if it has some connection to a physical place of public accommodation. Um, a third theory is that you don't care about physical places, but you do care about whether it's the kind of website, if it's a website that offers the same kind of goods and services as the list of public accommodations in Title III. So you move your business from a storefront to the internet um, because you're doing the same kind of business, you would be, your website's covered. And then finally, a, a, a fourth theory is it doesn't matter. Websites are themselves public accommodations, um, even though they may not be tied to anything physical at all, just by their nature. If they're serving clients, at least in the United States, they are public accommodations. Um, we don't know the answer. I'm sorry, a little too fast there. Um, we don't know the answer to any of these questions for certain because the Supreme Court has not yet ruled. Um, there's a non-website case called South Dakota versus Wayfair in which the um, Supreme Court treats websites as if they were the equivalent of a public accommodation, that is a physical a public accommodation. Uh, but that's all we have is that hint. 
a case that would have brought this um, matter to the Supreme Court, filed by Domino's Pizza, uh, was uh, so the Supreme Court rejected certiorari. Uh, where that leaves us today is with two main theories. Several circuits hold that a website that sells goods and services is covered by the ADA, even if there's no place of business. And two circuits, the 11th Circuit and the 9th Circuit, hold that a website is not covered by the ADA unless it is somehow connected with a physical place of business. Uh, that is, those holdings, or the holding in the Ninth Circuit, is the reason why Ninth Circuit state court website cases are exploding. Because California has its own version of the ADA called the Unruh Act. And California courts have held that the Unruh Act covers all websites, regardless of a physical connection. So if you're in California, which has always been a hotbed of ADA litigation, and you want to sue a website that isn't attached to a physical place of business, you sue in state court, and you sue under the Unruh Act. However, in the federal courts, we do not know the answer for sure. It depends on which circuit you're in. And in fact, recently, um, a court, a federal court in California, in Florida rather, um, stayed a website accessibility lawsuit on the theory that the 11th Circuit might hold in a case that's pending before it that the ADA does not cover websites at all. So that first option, ADA doesn't cover websites at all, is still on the table in the 11th Circuit, or at least one federal judge thinks so. So we're not sure if the ADA covers websites or why. What injury does Title III protect against? Um, is it protecting against inability to get to the website itself as a place. Um, this would be analogous, uh, and this is a theory that the 11th Circuit has adopted for certain. Um, that is, it's analogous to the front door of a, bill, of a business. If you can't use the website, you can't get into the business. Um, or is it more narrow? Does Title III only guarantee access to the goods and services offered by the website. In this case, the website might have some inaccessible features. It might have things that a person who is using a screen reader can't do or can't see. But if the website still offers access to the goods and services, the main point, then it would be accessible. Um, a third, somewhat more limited theory is does it offer access to goods and services offered by the website operator? Under this theory, you'd say it doesn't matter if you can buy these things on the website itself if you can buy them in a store. So does the website give you access to something in a physical store in a meaningful way? And then finally, we have the meaningful access. That is, does the ADA simply guarantee something called meaningful access. Um, well, we don't know which of those it is because we don't have a clear theory of why the ADA applies to websites in the first place. We do have um, hundreds now of federal court, um, district court level decisions, but of course district level decisions are not binding on anybody, including the judge who um, entered them. However, we, it is useful, even though we have all this uncertainty, to talk about meaningful access and to talk about technical perfection because your clients are going to face this issue when they think about the practical, the most practical aspect of website accessibility, which is can somebody who's disabled use the website? Now, um, I put up a diagram here that shows how a person in a wheelchair uh, or the space that a person in a wheelchair needs to use a ramp or a hallway or another path. In the world of the Americans with Disabilities Act, in the, in the physical world, we have a very specific set of regulations defining what access means. Um, the 2010 accessibility standards 
will tell you that if a ramp is no more than five degrees in slope and that it is no longer than a certain length, then that ramp is accessible to a person in a wheelchair. Even if some people in a wheelchair might not be able to get up that ramp, and even if other people in wheelchairs might be able to get up a steeper ramp, the ADA tells you a, a 5% slope on a ramp is fine. Um, it will tell you that a 36-inch wide doorway is fine, even if some people couldn't get through that doorway. So with physical access, we have a standard. If you meet the standard, you're good. Um, if you don't meet the standard, then by definition, you're not good. Um, so that, that would be a technical perfection type standard. And I will tell you, um, we'll see, we'll talk about a technical perfection standard, but right now there is no regulation establishing such a standard for Title III businesses. Um, for federal websites, Section 4, uh, 508 of the Rehabilitation Act has uh, adopted a technical standard. And if a federal website meets that technical standard, it's considered accessible whether or not there are disabled users who cannot use it. But we don't have that for Title III, and we don't have that for Title II. Um, so we have this more vague idea of what's meaningful access, or is it meaningfully accessible? Does it do enough for the website user? Um, looking at the technical approach, if you haven't heard of it yet, you need to remember the WCAG the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, they, uh, published by the w, uh, W3C, um, which is an international group of academics, businesses, and others. Um, W3C itself is concerned with standards for the Internet of all kinds. Almost every time you use the Internet, you're using something that's subject to a W3C standard but it's a voluntary industry standard. As part of that, uh, beginning in the early 2000s, uh, W3C developed web content accessibility guidelines called WCAG. Um, these guidelines uh, define in technical terms what it means for a website to be accessible. They're reasonably complicated. It's broken down into um, principles um, accessible, uh, individual accessible items, and then thousands of pages of techniques, but it's a technical guideline. Um, why would you want a technical guideline? Well, um, for, w, for Title III entities, um, the arguments are first, it would line up with federal websites. It would certainly be nice if a Title III entity could say, look, and um, if we do the same thing the federal government does, we ought to be in good shape. And it would also mean that developers of assistive technologies would be able to say, look, if we can make our assistive technologies work with this standard, then it will be good across the board. Um, so it, it would line up with federal websites. It would pretty much line up with the Air Carrier Access Act. Uh, but most important, businesses want certainty. They want to be able to develop their website and know that when they are finished, they have complied with Title III of the ADA. Just like a business that's putting in an accessible parking space wants to know for sure that if it has the right slopes and the right widths, they won't get sued because somebody thinks it's not accessible in a meaningful way. Um, businesses want the same thing for their websites. They would like to know that there's a technical standard that if they meet it, it's a safe harbor. Um, what you need to know if you're a lawyer about WCAG is um, in broad outline, as I said, there are four principles of accessibility, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, we could spend a long time talking about that, but we don't have time. There are 13 guidelines within those four principles. And within those 13 guidelines, there are 50 success criteria um, with three levels of success called A, AA, and AAA. And there are hundreds of sufficient and advisory techniques, that is, um, specific ways to achieve the goal of accessibility under those 
um, under those success criteria. Now, one of the things you should know is this slide is slightly out of date already. Um, this slide was prepared um, with, based on WCAG 2.0. It was replaced by WCAG 2.1 um, in 2019. It has more guidelines and more success criteria. WCAG 2.2 uh, is uh, on the table, and WCAG 3.0 is going to be coming up in a few years. And each one of those is going to expand the number of guidelines and success criteria because as technologies used in websites um, diversify and become more numerous, the WCAG standards are trying to keep up by defining what accessibility means for all of the new tools and features that are appearing in websites. Um, so, this is the technical standard. It's complicated. A, a lot of web developers, maybe most web developers, are not familiar with it at all or do not understand it. That's why most websites, that's why 97% are not accessible based on the WCAG standard. Um, in contrast, of course, we have the meaningful access approach. Um, the, the phrase meaningful access comes from Supreme Court decisions based on federal statutes uh, predating the Internet, guaranteeing meaningful access to federal government programs. Um, and of course, it applies under the ADA to Title II entities. Um, has the, the, the Supreme Court case for those who are interested in such things is called Alexander versus Choate. And the emphasis is whether it provides even-handed treatment of those with disabilities. Now, here's the problem. Uh, as the uh, Eastern District of Pennsylvania observed in 2007, few courts have explored how to define meaningful access or determine when a program provides or denies disabled people meaningful access to its benefit. So it's not a very well-defined term. And from a practical standpoint, that means that if you are sued by someone who says that your website does not provide meaningful access to those with disabilities, you aren't going to get out of that lawsuit without a trial. Because when you don't have a good standard, you don't have a good way to get out on dismissal or summary judgment. And we'll see how that influences litigation as we go along. Um, guidance from the courts. Technical versus meaningful access? Well, the Department of Justice has used WCAG 2.0 as its standard for settlements since 2005. And until, 2000, until version 2.1 came out, WCAG 2.0 AA was widely considered as the appropriate standard for business websites. Um, however, the courts have not necessarily agreed with this. Um, I've got, I cite a case called Diaz versus Diaz. That's not actually a case. That refers to the fact that there are two cases with Diaz as the plaintiff. In one case, the defendants succeeded in proving that the lawsuit was moot by proving that their website complied with WCAG 2.0. In the other Diaz case, a different federal judge said no, because there's no regulation that specifies that WCAG 2.0 is sufficient, he would have to have a trial to decide what accessibility meant. Um, that, in a nutshell, is why we have confusion about the law. Two federal judges, both in the Second Circuit, uh, both in the Southern District of New York, did not agree with each other about this question of accessibility standards. Um, and now I'm going to give you my opinion what are opinions like? Here's a picture. Um, if you're involved in litigation, if you're a plaintiff, pleading nonconformance to WCAG will get past Rule 12b6 motion to dismiss. That is, I think it's going to be, courts are almost universally going to find that a pleading of nonconformance to WCAG adequately pleads a, a, a failure to be accessible under Title III. Um, based on the Diaz case, that one, I would say that the, the least 
a website owner will have to prove at summary judgment in order to get the case dismissed is both that there is WCAG 2.x, either 0 or 1 conformance, and that anything specific the plaintiff has mentioned has also been fixed, whether or not it was a WCAG nonconformance. Um, turning that over to win at trial, a plaintiff's going to have to prove not only that there are WCAG violations or nonconformances, but also that those nonconformances in fact deny meaningful access. And if you plunge down into the details of WCAG 2.0, it is very possible to have a nonconformance with this technical standard that has no consequences at all for a disabled person's ability to use a website. So I think plaintiffs are going to have to prove both if they ever get a case to trial. Um, and then qualified by saying lazy courts are probably going to just take WCAG 2.0 or 2.1 um, as a technical standard, even though many courts have said it's not adequate. What about Title III defenses? Uh, undue burden, fundamental alteration, and unreasonable modification. Um, undue burden is a possible defense. It can be very expensive to remediate websites, but in general, the approach of the courts has been that a burden is not undue unless it literally bankrupts the business. So any business that wants to stay in business with its website probably can't use an undue burden defense. Uh, fundamental alteration and unreasonable modification are almost certain to fail because there's nothing about making a website accessible that fundamentally alters its nature and there's nothing about modifying it that is necessarily unreasonable. After all, the modifications to make a website accessible are almost all completely invisible to users who don't have a disability. Another open set of questions, who's responsible? Well, owners, yes. The owner of a website is always going to be liable if um, for a failure to meet ADA accessibility requirements. This is all subject to if the ADA applies at all in the particular circuit in which you're sued. How about the operator of a website? Uh, not always the same as the owner. The ADA generally says that those who operate places of public accommodation are liable, um, even if they're not the owner. So the guy who leases a retail space is liable for ADA um, violations within his retail space. The, extending that to websites, you'd say, well, someone who operates a website should be liable for um, inaccessibility. But remember, that depends on the theory being that the website is a public accommodation. If it's not a public accommodation, maybe the operator is not liable. How about developers? Um, there's been a, a few cases who have had, that have held that developers of websites who develop inaccessible websites can be liable. So far, the plaintiff's bar isn't going after developers, but developers are at risk. Franchisors, um, are they liable for franchisee websites? Um, under the ADA, we have a well-developed body of law concerning when a franchisor has sufficient control over something the franchisee does to be liable for ADA violations, um, and those are probably going to apply to websites as well. And then finally, uh, plug-in pluggers, as I call them. We'll see in a minute what I think of the people who sell plugins that supposedly make websites accessible. But can they be liable if the website is not accessible after their plugin is used? Uh, that's an open question that um, has not been answered. And finally, apps. Um, mobile apps of all kinds have in the last um, 18 months or so become increasingly under attack by the same plaintiffs who sue websites. But how do we look at an app? Um, is an app itself a public accommodation? Uh, that's certainly a theory that's been applied to websites. Is it maybe just a service of a public accommodation? Keeping in mind that services of public accommodations also have to be accessible. What if it's the service of an internet-only business 
and the internet only website is not required to be accessible. Does that mean that the website that apps related to it don't have to be accessible? Probably depends on which court you're in. And what about games and utilities? Is a game an inventory item? Uh, the ADA generally says that you don't have to modify your inventory for those with disabilities. Or is it a service? In which case, the ADA would generally say that services must be accessible. This question hasn't been resolved, but it has been litigated. Um, there are uh, cases going on right now um, against the operators of online um, interactive experiences, um, the kind where you wear goggles to enter a virtual world. Um, we're going to find out if that's a game that doesn't have to be accessible or if it's a service that does. Will Congress save the day? Um, you can um, look at my blog or the blog of uh, Bill Gorin, understandtheada.com, to see about a bill that was introduced in late 2020 to reform the ADA and to explicitly deal with websites by creating a new chapter of the ADA, Title VII. Um, the uh, Congress, which apparently had other things on its mind toward the end of the last congressional session, failed to take up the bill. Uh, but it's likely that it will be reintroduced sometime in the next Congress. Um, the bill, when it was introduced, was widely criticized and opposed by disabilities rights groups and by lawyers who make money from disability um, lawsuits. It was widely praised by businesses, um, including the Chambers of Commerce. Um, it remains to be seen what will happen with a new administration, although um, this is a bipartisan bill, but generally both Democrats and Republicans have been afraid to take on the disability advocates. And similar attempts, not as sophisticated as this one, but similar attempts over the last decade have all failed. So what are you going to do? You don't have legal certainty. You certainly can't advise your client that for sure if they do this or if they do that, they will uh, win a website lawsuit. But that doesn't mean there is nothing you can do. So there are four steps to reducing risk and creating accessibility at the same time. And those, are both, those are the two things that you want to do because you want to serve customers by making the website accessible and you want to reduce litigation risk. The first thing is to adopt a policy and make it public. Adopting a meaningful policy and a meaningful policy is a policy that has deadlines and a budget, can help persuade a court that your website, even though not quite accessible, is going to be accessible, and therefore a lawsuit is of diminished risk. So adopt a policy that includes a deadline and a budget and make it public. Second thing you can do is use arbitration to fend off serial filers. If we had a lot of time, I would explain exactly how this works. But in general, it is possible to put an enforceable arbitration clause in a website that would require an individual with a disability to go to arbitration if they claim the website is inaccessible. And in the context of modern website accessibility litigation, that might be enough to make the plaintiff just quit. Third step, machine testing and remediation. Uh, machine testing um, will help you find the most obvious problems with a website. This uses software tools. Um, and then user testing creates a genuinely accessible website by having actual users who with disabilities systematically test the website to see what problems exist. Um, a little more detail on each of these. Policies matter if there's a plan. As you can see, Antoine de saint Perret, the author of The Little Prince, said a goal without a plan is just a wish. And a goal without a plan in the ADA world is not going to help you in court. But if you have a policy, a timeline, a budget, and a plan for ongoing maintenance of your website, you may be able to persuade a court that an ADA lawsuit seeking injunctive relief is unnecessary. The arbitration gambit. If you can prove that the user had notice, 
that you manage to meet whatever state law requirements you have, and you keep your policies straight, um, you might conceivably force a website, uh, a disabled website user to go to arbitration instead of federal or state court. Um, Uber, uh, I have a site here to my blog where I discuss this. Um, there's a well-known Uber case um, concerning the arbitrability. Uh, it, um, Uber lost. They were unable to arbitrate the website claims. But if you look at the Uber case, the discussion uh, basically lays out in detail what you have to do to have an, a, an enforceable arbitration clause. Machine testing and what I call the invisible website. When I gave you that statistics earlier that said 97% of the top million websites fail a basic test of accessibility, um, that the statistic was developed using software that scanned websites looking for WCAG 2.0 nonconformance. Um, that saw the standard can be readily tested by software in some respects. So you test your website, you fix whatever the software tells you is wrong with it. That will not fix 60% or more of the problems, uh, at least according to the consultants I've talked to. But the plaintiffs who file these lawsuits use the same kind of software. So if you fix all of the things that software finds, then even though your website is still not accessible, it may be essentially invisible to the plaintiffs. That's a good thing, as well as being a first start. And then finally, user testing and complete remediation. Um, it's absolutely necessary to have an accessible website. Um, it is also expensive and takes time. Finally, widgets don't work. Um, that's what WWW stands for. There are a number of companies that sell um, software packages that plug into or attach themselves to a website and claim to make it accessible. Um, they are frequently relatively inexpensive. They may cost $100 um, or $100 a year for a license. Um, they all have one thing in common. They don't work. They will not make a website accessible. Some of them make the website worse because they um, interfere with screen reader and other assistive technologies. Um, if your client comes to you and says, listen, we found this great deal, it's 50 bucks, it makes our website accessible, you can advise them with some certainty that it's a complete waste of money. Okay, what do you do if your client is sued? And we'll go through this fairly quickly since uh, time is running out. The main thing you need to know is this, another, this is just another kind of serial litigation. Website accessibility lawsuits, if they're not brought in the name of um, a national disability rights organization like the National Federation for the Deaf or one of those, if they're, not, if they're brought in the name of an individual plaintiff, they are probably one of hundreds of lawsuits brought by the law firm that has that plaintiff as their tool. Uh, the goal of these lawsuits is settlement and a profit to the lawyer who filed the lawsuit. So what they want to do is get enough money that they make, you know, triple, quadruple, something like that, a normal billing rate, so they make a substantial profit. The price of settlement is set below the cost of a defense because they don't want you to defend the case and settle later. They would prefer to settle for less at the very outset. Um, this makes defending these cases usually a waste of money, unless you have a client who's very angry and very rich. Um, and typically, the settlement's going to require that the website be made accessible, that it be remediated. Um, whether that's a meaningful requirement or not is of some doubt. Most of the settlement agreements that I've seen have so many conditions and exceptions that the defendant who has in theory agreed to make their website accessible has in fact not agreed to anything that could be enforced. Um, the main point of these lawsuits is not accessibility, it is putting money in the hands of the lawyers. What are your options? Well, um, I mentioned four here. Uh, these are the trolls thinking about how they're gonna eat the hobbits from the Lord of the Rings. 
The first option is no surrender, no retreat. This was the option that Domino's took when it was sued on a website accessibility claim and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, the advantage, it makes lawyers rich. I think that's a significant advantage that clients don't appreciate as much as they should. Disadvantage, you cannot win a website accessibility lawsuit without remediating the website anyway. And of course, it's even more expensive if you lose. So uh, no surrender, no retreat, great for lawyers. Um, I haven't found any clients who fully appreciate why that is the only consideration they should think about. How about default as a defense? Um, in physical access ADA cases, it is not uncommon to simply default. Let the court enter a judgment, um, figuring that whatever the court orders is not going to be any worse than what you were going to have to agree to anyway. Uh, the only problem is the court may order you to actually remediate the website within a time frame that is inconvenient or in ways that are too expensive, whereas in a settlement you can probably put so many conditions on the remediation obligation that it is more voluntary than compulsory. Offer of judgment, Rule 68, you offer to fix the website. You try to offer more than the plaintiff can possibly win, thus forcing them to accept your offer of judgment. Downside, the offer you're going to make to have a meaningful Rule 68 offer is the same as the settlement you could reach without making the offer. And finally, there's making a deal. There are, um, the only thing you need to know, or the things you need to know about making a deal are you have to know your opponent. There are four tiers of website plaintiff's attorneys. The most serious are willing to litigate cases. They'll take them to trial and up on appeal, and they demand more money to settle. At the bottom tier, there are literally people who are just sending out demand letters in the hope that they might get a few dollars, um, and you don't have to give them much. Sometimes you can ignore them entirely. Um, you have to think about whether you're going to enter into a public consent decree, which has advantages, or a confidential settlement, which has the advantage of confidentiality. You have to make sure that the terms of performance are appropriate, and I think usually you can make sure they're appropriate in the sense you don't have to do anything. And future litigation is an issue um, that argues for consent decrees, um, even though the consent decrees are not bulletproof by any means. Uh, finally, you should fight if you have to fight, but do not fight if you don't have to fight. In almost every case, you're going to want to settle. Um, and the reason is we're going to look at some failed defenses to conclude. Um, in the hundreds of cases, thousands now that have been settled, but hundreds of cases that have been at least litigated through a motion to dismiss or summary judgment, the defenses of due process, primary jurisdiction, and the argument that the ADA doesn't cover websites at all have pretty much universally failed. It is a waste of time to raise any of these defenses um, at all. It, it, these, are, these are doomed defenses. You can look for a better court. You can um, try to preempt a lawsuit by filing a deck action. You can try to move a lawsuit uh, with uh, lack of in personam jurisdiction or change of venue. You might remove a state court action to federal court. You'll find that all of these are difficult. Most businesses from a website standpoint are doing business in all 50 states. And um, removal to federal court has been made impossible by the way California plaintiffs' lawyers plead their cases. Standing, these are potentially good defenses. Um, it's very likely that many website plaintiffs do not have standing because they have suffered no injury. The problem is these defenses cannot be reached and developed for less than the cost of settlement. So the rich, angry client may want to push this, push through a standing defense at great expense. It's almost universally going to be better to settle. And then moodness. Moodness is the best defense if you fix the website then the claim is moot and has to be dismissed. The only problem, since we don't know what it means to have an accessible website, we don't know what it means to moot a website accessibility claim. What your clients need to know, yesterday was too late. They need to adopt a policy now. They need to set deadlines. They need to set a budget. They need to start machine testing. They need to do all of it before this webinar is over in a minute and a half.
Um, and finally, I'm here to help or fee. There's my contact information if you want to get in touch with me. I love to discuss these issues, um, and to a certain extent, I will do it for nothing, but if you need advice, I generally charge. And that leads to questions. And I see some exclamation points on the Q&A, but Naja, I will turn this back over to you. Sure thing. If everyone can type in either of the passcodes, um, ADA or Stormy, in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, it is 4 o'clock. I am going to ask two questions, and then I'm going to email the remainder of the questions to um, Mr. Hunt, and um, he will um, contact you all separately with the responses. Okay. Right, so I'll answer all the the, Okay. So the first question is, is it worth purchasing a plug-in like Accessible or AudioEye? No. Um, they don't, they, um, they provide very limited help to certain kinds of low vision users. But that won't stop a lawsuit because the people suing are blind, not low vision. They do interfere with screen readers. They do not fix major accessibility problems related to the structure of the website. I think they're a complete waste of money. Um, and then that second question is, do you have a rec do you recommend a vendor to make a client's website WCAG 2.1 compliant? No, I, I don't have a vendor that I recommend because I'm not um, technically versed enough to say which vendors are offering better services at a better price. I do have a list of consultants, and if anyone wants to email me, I will be happy to send them my list. Um, these are mostly consultants that I've worked with, and so I can say things like they're very responsive or they ignored me for weeks. But, I, uh, but in terms of who's going to do a good job for a good price, um, I don't have the technical expertise to say that. Thank you, Richard. Um, please remember that um, if you are applying for CLE credit, um, you must complete the survey that's going to pop up on your screen afterwards. If it does not pop up, please just send me an email and I'll send you a, um, a hard copy of it. But um, I definitely wanted to thank um, Dr. Uh, sorry, Richard Hunt for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Richard or if you would like to speak with someone from TASA, feel free to um, give us a call at 1-800-523-2319. Um, I will be sending the recorded presentation to you via email tomorrow. And um, if you could give me a week for the, uh, the uh, CLE credit, that's when you will get it via email. Um, it may be less time than that, but um, if you can give me a week, that'd be perfect. Um, this concludes our program for today, and thank you everyone for attending.